quickly and we need to be active. Welcome to the sixth lecture for uh, regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning. In today's lecture, we are moving on from mining and environmental impact assessment that we looked at last week. And we're going to look at another um, major extractive industry in Queensland, coal seam gas. I'm going to link in um, with this lecture also a discussion of ports and major infrastructure projects just as it logically links in the big CSG projects that occurred um, about five years ago all involved major port expansions and that was a major concern with them so it's a logical place to bring it in. Um, and then obviously next week we'll go on to talk more about environmental harm and pollution in the context of the Environmental Protection Act but specifically this week focused on CSG petroleum. Okay, so in today's lecture, the problem that I'm going to focus on is the Santos GLNG project, G for Gladstone, uh, LNG liquefied natural gas, and I'm going to use that as a stepping off point to give you an overview about the CSG LNG industries in Queensland, and then look at does the proposed activity comply with the law, and if not, what steps need to be taken to make them comply, uh, what laws regulate these activities, applications, um, we'll particularly see the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act, as opposed to last week we were looking at the Mining Act. Um, petroleum, which includes coal seam gas, is regulated under the Petroleum and Gas Act. There's also a need for an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act, and then these big projects are all coordinated projects under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act as well. So talk about those. Uh, I'm going to um, link in not just the extraction, uh, and pipeline, but also the port and the um, refinery, the hub that's been created in Gladstone for them. So um, similar sorts of broad um, issues as we've considered in earlier lectures, but this time focused on CSG. So just as an overview, um, this is a extract from the Korea Mail from 2013, which I thought was a nice table summarising um, the four big CSG slash LNG projects that were proposed at the time. So there were three really big ones and one that was still big but not as ginormous as the three. So the three big ones were the AP LNG which was proposed by Origin Energy and Joint Ventures, QC LNG which was proposed by QGC, a big British multinational, then the GLNG um, proposed by Santos and Joint Ventures and that's the one we'll focus on. Uh, and then Arrow Energy had a proposal. It's since gone defunct. It's been stopped um, beginning of last year. All of the um, first three um, all went through the approval processes, were approved, all started producing either last year or this year. So they've had their first shipments out of Gladstone. All of them have experienced on the last few years severe financial um, problems because of the um, the massive drop-off in the price of um, oil globally also affected petroleum prices generally, including for liquefied natural gas. So projects that were proposed in sort of 2008, 2009, went through the approval processes, got approved, constructed. From the time they were proposed to when they actually started producing, the, yeah, the prices that they were getting just dropped right away. Um, and a number of the projects have had billions of dollars of basically written off. So they wouldn't probably occur if they, were, if they were to be on the books now. The companies probably wouldn't go ahead with them, but they started in boom times and it's not boom times now. So the industry has, even though it's producing now, had really contracted from, say, five years ago. So you guys, if you were graduating five years ago, there was lots of work in both the exploration and construction works out in central Queensland for the coal seam gas, for, mine, for environmental managers, engineers, you know, environmental scientists, as well as in the construction sector in Gladstone for the construction of the big hubs. Um, because that, that work is largely finished now and, and they're curtailing further expansion, a lot of the, you know, there's still work in the sector, but it's massively changed from where it was five years ago. Okay, so that's a broad um, summary. Um, as I said, they've all experienced significant difficulties. This is just um, 
a, a, just a screen grab of a, an article from last year, from April last year, so a year ago, basically saying that all of the producers were struggling and basically saying they also um, were pretty stupid in how they went about replicating, all doing their own thing, their own pipeline, their own um, refinery uh, at in Gladstone, instead of combining and having a single um, gas gas train which produces the refines the gas and then liquefies it, they all produce their own hubs because they all didn't want to be in partnership with the others and beholden to you know constraints. They all thought it was going to be this great bonanza of money, uh, and it turns out that they've actually thrown a lot of money away. So um, they didn't collaborate, and yeah. So in t if we look at an overview in terms of Australia's natural gas basins, obviously you know um, Bass Strait, um, uh, south of um, Victoria between Hobart and, sorry, between Tasmania and Victoria, Bass Strait, significant amount of um, natural gas that's been developed um, decades ago. Also off northwestern Australia, Western Australia, you know about the big um, offshore um, gas um, petroleum extraction occurring there. You might have known that Queensland also produced a significant amount of natural gas and petroleum from the southwest. So you can see there the eastern gas market and um, see those red lines going in which are pipelines. So um, that's been producing for decades but it's really been uh, just in the last decade that um, coal seam gas closer to the coast has really grown. So that's natural gas, and I'm going to distinguish between natural gas and coal seam gas in a moment, but um, basically natural gas is where you can extract it in gaseous form from, um, yeah, from basically reservoirs of the natural gas. Coal seam gas is extracted from the coal beds, and you typically have to dewater the coal beds to allow the gas to flow. Um, and it's linked much more to um, the known coal beds. So you can see here this map of um, basically coal seam, sorry, of coal resources and um, coal seam gas associated with that. So going through central Queensland. And then this is just a map of petroleum and coal seam gas deposits in Queensland, but the red lines are the pipelines. So um, in southwest uh, Queensland, we've got um, that Cooper, um, your manga oil and gas um, deposits um, and pipelines come across to Brisbane. Yeah, you've got a question? Yeah, just, what about shale gas? Is that different again? Yeah, sh shale gas is, is different again. Um, I'm mainly focusing on coal seam gas because it's, it's basically what the big thing that's been in, in Queensland. There's been a range of different proposals for other um, coal gasification, range of different things. CSG has been the big one for the last decade, so I'll just try and unpack that a bit and distinguish it from the typical natural gas. Um, so, um, and you can see there a pipeline running from southwest Queensland up to Mount Isa, so that was for the power station. Um, up in Mount Isa for the big mines up there and refineries. Um, so th this is just a close-up map of gas pipelines along the Queensland coast, particularly now going into Gladstone. Okay, you can find a heap of information about um, coal seam gas, obviously, on the internet. A really good website is the ABC website, which has been set up in 2012, but I really like it because you can sort of do things like produce graphs like this, which show you that the number of wells, which um, from, you know, during, say, say 2008 onwards was when people started to really become concerned about coal seam gas. It had been around for quite some time. You can see we had wells back in the 90s and some of the advertising from um, coal seam gas companies has basically had interviews with farmers who've had, you know, coal seam gas wells in their properties for a long time and said there's no problem, they get an income, it's all great. But the real concern which really sparked community um, anger and hostility to it, um, and you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with Lock the Gate as a community organisation, was the huge expansion of the industry. So this was basically a graph of back in 2012 before it, you know, the industry um, 
went really off the boil, but basically it was proposed that there would be up to 40,000 wells in Queensland. So going from, say, the 90s where you've got, you know, a few hundred to having 40,000 wells growing exponentially um, was a huge concern to the um, rural sector particularly because all of this development was occurring across their land with wells basically popping up across um, farmlands. Farmers concerned about, particularly about aquif um, their water, aquifers uh, and damage that might occur and yeah, it was big, it was rapid, it was caused a lot of, a lot of concern. Okay, and that website also allows you to do some pretty cool little mapping things. So you can go in and put different layers in. So this is um, just a screen grab of one of the maps showing um, wells um, planned to 2015 in black, um, and then petroleum leases and applications for leases. So petroleum leases were in orange, and the applications for leases in grey. So yeah, there's existing at that time, and then that was the area that it was proposing to expand over. And notice how it, oh, so this is covering both Queensland and New South Wales, all the way down through the Hunter. So particularly in New South Wales, Lock the Gate has been very successful in getting the state government to restrict um, coal seam gas um, development, uh, in particularly in farming areas. So that's where there's been real flashpoints. So. Um, and yeah, if, you just, if I just focus in on that map, um, you can see the black dots are where existing wells and then the orange is petroleum leases and the grey is applications. So you can see it covered a huge area of Queensland and those um, petroleum leases are areas where you'd, you'd expect to see the wells um, basically expanding out into. So, but particularly around Roma, you can see all those, um, yeah, all the wells around there. Okay, so if we focus on the Santos GLNG as just one of the three big ones, so each of these projects, the capital expenditure was somewhere around um, 16 to 20 billion dollars. I saw figures of like 22 billion dollars to develop them. So enormous amounts of money. If you think about, you know, at the time when these were all proposed, there was all the fight about the national broadband network and how the opposition of the time were complaining that the Australian government wanted to spend, I think it was originally $40 billion to, you know, create a national broadband network and that the opposition under Tony Abbott was saying it's, it's just a ridiculous amount to spend. And these three projects were each, you know, com well, the three of them were like about $60 billion worth of capital expenditure, so one and a half times the national broadband network. So enormous amount of money. Um, you can go to the Santos GLNG website, plenty of information there about what they're doing, a lot of community um, sort of spiel, um, there's some nice little film clips. Uh, the companies all recognised in about 2012 that they had a major public re relations problem and they engaged in you know, a lot of advertising, a lot of um, yeah, basically trying to deal with the community anger. Now, the, as I said, the three big ones have all shipped the first shipments last year or um, early this year. So the Santos GLNG um, shipped its first cargo in October 2015, and this was the first um, ship out. And you can see the gas hub, or they call it a gas train, um, for basically the refinery for the gas in the distance on Curtis Island in, um, Gladstone. So that's the first one going out. Okay, so just to unpack that a bit, we're talking about extracting the gas around Roma, and the projects had a number of sub projects within them. So there was um, the Comet Ridge, Ridge project area, the Roma area project, um, and they basically made their applications around those, well there were, there were um, three areas for the GLNG project components and then they had a pipeline that went out to Gladstone and so basically you start with a well um, coming out of the ground, I'll explain what's going on underground in a moment and then basically it's piped to the refinery um, and you're talking about you know from Roma to Gladstone as the crow flies about 500 kilometres so um, you know, it's a long way to build a pipeline. Um, if you go into Glad Gladstone, you can see here, um, this is just a, 
screen grab of um, existing port infrastructure, and it's Curtis Island um, over, um, which is just a big island off Gladstone, where the um, three LNG hubs were, or the four originally, were all proposed um, just in the southwestern um, border of it. And Gladstone, as you know, is already a major, it's already a major port. There's um, coal exports going out. There's a number of um, refineries and other heavy industries uh, in the area. So it's a major port already. Um, and these were proposed, the gas was proposed to go over um, on the island just across and this is just a um, screen grab of the precincts um, for that. So you can see the APLNG, um, Gas Hub, QCLNG, GLNG, and then Arrow. And this is, um, I think, around, around 2013, so that um, we've cleared the sites, but you've got the three sites, I've just marked them there, APLNG, QCLNG, and GLNG, all under construction, all at the same time. And as I say, now, with hindsight, it probably would have been really sensible for them to just have one hub, but they all went there, they wanted their own, so they've, we've got triplicate of the gas hubs, which yeah, generated a lot of jobs at the time, um, but yeah, it's, it's led to big write-offs by the companies involved. So you can see this is looking back um, the other way, and the GLNG um, site is in the foreground here, partially completed. So, as I say, you can go and have a look at the website, um, a lot of information there, photographs and the like. That's it, pretty well completed. Um, and, yeah, if you actually go onto the site, a lot of pipes. Um, and most of the LNG um, is exported, or in fact all of the LNG would be exported because if you've still got it in gaseous form, you might as well just pipe it around on the network we've got in Queensland and New South Wales. So why do you have LNG? Um, this is obviously one of the ships, big, looks like bubbles or um, big containers. I'll, I'll put up on the blackboard side, I won't play them now, but um, like Australia Pacific LNG, AP LNG um, has some good little community explainers. They run for about five minutes. They sort of go from the well to the, through the pipeline. They're all nice and PR stuff. I won't play them now, but you can find, you can just easily find them on YouTube if you want to have a look at them. They're not, they're short. They're, they're simple explanations. Um, you can also go and look at Darren Lockyer's journey, which was um, the AP LNG um, engaged Darren Lockyer, who has had two careers. Um, one career was as a footballer, and you might know him from that career. Had, was very successful in that, um, but you didn't know that at the same time he was also studying for his doctorate in multiple areas, groundwater, climate change, uh, his coral reef scientist, um, amazing polymath, and that gives him the qualifications to tell you that it's safe. Um, you'll see if you go and look at the videos, Darren goes back to his origin from the Roma area, so he's a Roma boy, and you go and have a look at the videos, he says, I went and talk with some scientists and they said it was safe, so I reckon it's safe. Um, yeah, so a lot of PR spin. And yeah, he didn't have a second career. And, and I do like Darren Lockie. He's a, obviously he was a great footballer and he's a nice guy. Does he, does he, was his he voice originally like that? Or did he suffer an injury? I always think when he's on the, I always think when he's like a commentator, I think, can someone give him a glass of water? Yeah, he's a really, seems like a really nice bloke. But anyway, he's brought into this PR campaign to be a local boy, you know, hero in the Roma area, basically talks about how it's safe, what they're doing. Um, but obviously he's relying upon the company's advice for that and obviously being paid for it. But you can look at those sort of videos, um, easily available on the web. Let's just unpack it a little bit, um, because before I really looked at a few projects, I really didn't understand what CSG was and what was LNG, and so I just want to unpack it a little bit for you. So, coal seam gas, also known as coal bed methane, um, is a form of natural gas. Um, it's typically extracted from coal seams at depths of 300 to 1,000 metres. It's colourless, odourless, um, it's a mixture of a number of gases, but it's mainly methane, um, about 200 million years old and basically it's been bound in the coal. So compare it to natural gas. Um, so natural gas is a combustible mixture of hydrocarbons and it's primarily methane. So here's just your typical sort of mix. So methane, CH4, 70 to 90%, and then you've got things like ethane, propane, butane, etc. 
So when CSG comes out of the ground, it's mainly methane, but it'll have some impurities. And, and obviously, if you're a major gas producer and you're going to sell it, the person who's buying it is going to want to know what they're getting, and they're going to want a constant um, supply. So the refining is basically ensuring that you've got consistent properties to what you're selling. So ensuring that this mixture is the same, that you're always selling it as the same, and any impurities are removed. Um, so cooling natural gas to about 100 and minus 162 Celsius at normal pressure results in condensation to liquid, um, known as liquefied natural gas, and it's about one six hundredth of the volume of it as a gas. So obviously you can pipe gas around Australia, but if we want to export it, um, then basically turning it to liquid, putting it on the ship, obviously a lot more efficient if you basically send it as a liquid, and then it's regasified. Uh, say it's sold to Indonesia or China, gets there, it's um, unloaded and um, changed back to gas and then burnt wherever you are, you know, wherever the, it's being sold to. So that's why these big ships um, are used and yeah, they're holding it as a liquid. Okay, the difference between CSG and conventional gas um, basically is where you get them from. So um, natural gas, you generally call it conventional if it's coming from um, a um, reservoir where you've already got it in gaseous form and you can just extract it, like a, you know, like a balloon underground and you just tap into it and you pull out the gas. Whereas um, unconventional, you've got to do something to it to get it out, like shale gas or coulson gas. So coulson gas is in coal beds and you've typically got to pull out the water to um, reduce the pressure and allow the gas to flow. So, um, yeah, conventional natural gas reservoirs largely consist of porous sandstone formations capped by impermeable rock, and the gas is stored in the sandstone at high pressure so it can flow to the surface through production wells at a high flow rate, often without the need to pump. So that's your conventional natural gas. Um, and then CSG is called unconventional because it's not stored in conventional sandstone reservoirs, um, and it's contained in the fine structures or natural fractures of coal seams. And so normally, um, just to show you, so here's a well, and let's just say that goes down 800 metres um, to the coal bed underneath it. So there's been, they've drilled down 800 metres, and that's what you see on the top. It doesn't look like much um, as a single well. Um, there's just another picture from, um, you know, when you see a picture like this, it looks fine, you know, what's the problem? Cattle in the distance, small well like that. Another picture of um, a well fenced off. Um, and what the wells are doing, they're basically pulling out the water. So in this diagram, the um, water is shown as black lines um, and the gas is shown as red. So basically what the well is doing is pulling down the water and extracting it and then the gas is released and you can pull it out. And um, fracking is where they have to break it up with using some form of chemical, so breaking up the coal um, beds in some way, so injecting something and then basically breaking it up. But um, generally in Queensland there, there hasn't been a lot of fracking, it's basically just the extraction of the water and then the gas comes out, but fracking has been very controversial in the US. Um, so, so you get the basic idea, you pull down the water, reduce, re reduce the pressure, the gas flows, and then you pull out the water, because you've, you've got to get it out, and then you basically separate out the gas. Now, the big issue there is you end up with a hell of a lot of water, uh, and that's one of the big issues with the calcium gas industry, is what do you do with the water that you take out? Because it's typically brackish or saline, so um, you have to do something with it and you've got vast quantities of it. Here's just another diagram of pulling out, you know, using a pump um, and separating out the water and the gas. So the major environmental concerns associated with, I'll use CSG slash LNG because, you know, you're really looking at two sides of the same coin um, in Queensland. So um, groundwater um, is a big concern for a lot of farmers because 
Um, even though the wells are typically very deep, so the, the, ground, the CSG might be extracted from a coal bed that's, say, 800 metres deep, the farmers will be drawing water from aquifers in, the, say, the first couple of hundred metres of the surface. So the um, uh, gas companies say, we're not affecting the farmers' water because we're drawing water down from aquifers that are, they're not actually using. But the farmer's concern is about the interrelationship between the two. And if you pull out a hell of a lot of water deep down, what happens to the water at the surface and how interconnected, particularly on a regional scale, so they can be confining layers, regional aquitards, but if on a regional scale there are faults um, and the, the upper aquifers are connected, to the lower aquifers, you can see the concern that if you dewater the lower aquifers, you basically, just like a colander, you know, all the top aquifers might just drain away. And maybe not immediately, but over decades, um, you end up with very little water um, for agricultural um, uses at the surface. Uh, and because the areas involved are so enormous and there's so many wells, you can see the, the unknown is, the unknowns are great. And you can see why farmers would be really concerned about it because, you know, in central Queensland or central New South Wales, groundwater is how you make a living. You know, you've got to water your stock. Um, so groundwater is a big deal. Okay, the other big issue is the water that's pulled out from the wells, um, what do you do with it? So the wastewater, so um, there's a number of different options you might have. You might just put it in a big um, uh, dam and let it evaporate. You still end up with a lot of salt, but then you, know, you basically get rid of it. But you need vast evaporation ponds. Um, or you can treat it, so some of the producers of um, dealt with the brackish water by treating it and, um, redu and improving its quality to the point where it can be sold back to farmers for agricultural use. So, yeah, I've got a question. Is something in the process of extracting it that makes it saline? Yeah, great question. Um, is there something in the process that makes it saline? No. Um, it's saline from basically being embedded in the coal. So it's been there for, you know, the water has been there for a long time and it's just basically what you're pulling out. Um, so it's not the process itself, it's the actual water quality um, was saline or brackish to, to start with. So that would have never been used for agriculture? It would have never been used for agriculture, yeah. So most of the CSG that we're targeting is, you know, really deep. So the, the um, farmers tend to be using, if they've got a bore, it might go down, you know, 100, 150 metres. And, and so you're drawing water um, from those surface aquifers as opposed to, um, you know, a bore that's, say, a kilometre deep. So disposal of saline water is a big issue. Um, fracking, um, and I, I emphasise not all CSG project, projects use fracking, but it's been particularly a concern in the US. And the issue there has been the chemicals that are used and potential to contaminate um, water supplies. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation, I'll show you a few photographs about that in a moment. Loss of agricultural land from wells and infrastructure and the like. Um, port expansion has been a big issue because of um, the, particularly in Gladstone, the major port expansion, which was occurring at the same time as a major expansion of the coal sector and Holyport ports were proposed along the Queensland coast. Increased shipping through the Great Barrier Reef and therefore increased risk of um, um, an oil spill or something like that. And the contribution of the greenhouse gases to climate change. So um, coal seam gas is often sold as less polluting than coal. Um, a lot of, still a lot of debate about that in the scientific literature and um, the more recent um, data indicates that the um, loss of the fugitive emissions as you're extracting are actually very significant and there, there's little um, climate benefit from coal seam gas um, seems to be the message that's coming out of the later studies. But to me the other issue is um, that this from a climate perspective um, is that a lot of the coal seams that we're targeting, they're really deep and they would have been uneconomic to target for coal. So um, the fact that we're tapping into them with CSG is just more carbon that we're pulling out of the ground and adding to the atmosphere. So it's additional to what we're taking out with coal because I made the point last week that our plan is to basically extract everything. Everything we've got, we'll dig it up 
put, pump it out of the ground and sell it. Um, so this is really just additional to what we're also going to sell from coal. So climate change is a significant issue and this is on a vast, vast scale. Now in terms of habitat loss, yeah, if you look at one, you know, you typically see in an advertising picture about um, CSG, you'll typically see one well close up. But if you jump in a plane, um, does anyone live out in Roma or in, flown in a plane out to Roma? If you get in a plane out to Roma, um, basically you look out and there, you just see vast networks of things like this stretching off into the distance. So this is obviously each one of those little pads has got a well on it and then they've connected it each of the wells with a road, um, and then when you add up that, you know, hundreds of wells, all connected by roads, each of those little pads and roads, and it all adds up, um, and it's all, you know, significant in terms of fragmentation, particularly not just the total area that's lost, but the fragmentation of the landscape. So this is just another image. Um, you can see the patchwork of um, CSG infrastructure across the landscape. So a really significant issue. And this picture I think is pretty horrific, but it looks, yeah, you know, you can just see the amount that's been cleared um, for, um, for the development. Okay, that's habitat fragmentation. Massive water use by CSG is another issue. So, um, and again, the ABC website's a really good one for this. It has a nice little um, nice graphs that you can look at like this. So there's a map of the um, Great Artesian Basin, so the massive groundwater body that we've got um, flowing west from central Queensland down to South Australia and in northern New South Wales. And then if you look at Queensland, <coughs> the current water use by Queensland households is about 308 gigalitres or billion litres. Um, current extraction by farmers um, and other bore users from the Great Artesian Basin is about 540 gigalitres. And then there's very, very different projections about the amount of water that will be used or, or extracted by the CSG companies. So um, the different figures, um, so the um, 61 gigalitres, the one right down the left-hand side is company estimates and then 467 to 1,500 gigalitres are water group estimates provided to the federal government. So, you know, there's this massive range of what total amount of water um, is thought to be pulled out. Um, and then the National Water Commission estimate was 300. So, still a big chunk when you add that into um, water that's already been pulled out by um, farmers. So, um, and if you add in all of the petroleum leases across the GAB, so I'll just go back, so see there I've got the map of the GAB, and then if I just add in where the wells are and where the leases are for future wells, you can see the immediate issue for and concern that people have, that there's this huge new amount of water going to be pulled out, and how does that impact on the overall water budget for the Great Artesian Basin? So, um, yeah. So dealing with the salt from the extracted water is another big issue um, and um, I won't, don't need to go into that in detail. Um, climate change, I said last week, you know, our plan is to dig it all up and sell it all. So black here is um, coal exports going to 2035 expanding. Red at the top of the bars is um, petroleum or gas exports, um, so expanding um, out to 2035. 35, which was just when this um, policy document went to. So, you know, there's no, you won't see in any of these documents a cap, a total, any limits. It's basically, it's all, it's all to go. Um, okay, so that's background. What laws regulate these activities? And, and let's break this up. These, these projects involve the gas extraction, so the wells, then you join that all together in a pipeline to go to Gladstone, and at Gladstone there's a refinery. So there's three big elements of the actual, of each of these projects, or the GLNG project that we're focusing on. Now, I've given you this diagram before, so we've got at a Commonwealth level the um, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act um, is important, and a few years ago there was a trigger added in for 
um, um, mining or coal seam gas activities that have a significant impact on a water resource. So that was brought in um, in response to concern um, about coal seam gas extraction, particularly in mining um, impacts on groundwater from farmers. Um, so that's at a national level. But at a state level, we've got particularly the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act and the Environmental Protection Act. Now, the Santos GLNG project and other development, um, it led to serious concerns being expressed at an international level. This is unusual because normally when I say explain, you know, I would have talked about in lecture one explaining the system and saying, well, we've got this international level and it's significant, but most of your approvals occur at state level, so that's really where the bulk of your work is. International normally just sits there in the background and very rarely actually affects development on the ground directly. But in 2012, um, there was uh, international concern about particularly the port development occurring at the time, and it led to the World Heritage Committee expressing concerns um, in its role under the World Heritage Convention about the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef and whether the Great Barrier Reef, so under the World Heritage Convention, there's a list of World Heritage properties which the Great Barrier Reef is on. So properties of outstanding universal value that need to be protected for their international importance. There's also a list um, called the List of World Heritage in Danger, which is set up to basically provide a, um, a warning light if there is a property that's on the World Heritage List that's in danger of losing its World Heritage um, values. And it was originally set up to allow funds to, it was aimed at particularly developing countries where they might not be able to properly manage a site for funds to flow to, you know, to, to um, from the international community to um, those countries. but and has rarely been applied to countries like Australia. But Australia basically was in the spotlight in 2012 about whether the Great Barrier Reef should be added to that list because particularly of the port development. Um, and it's led to major ongoing reviews um, of Australian and Queensland planning for development adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef. So the, the World Heritage Committee's decisions and recommendations aren't binding on Australia but they sure as hell embarrassed the hell out of Australia. Um, and politically, um, it look, would look really bad for the federal government or the state government for an international body to be saying, you're not protecting the Great Barrier Reef because of the enormous public support for protection of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. At a domestic level, that looks really bad. So it led to a lot of, um, a, a really big response by the federal government and the state government. So um, basically, um, the um, World Heritage Committee was alerted to the development by conservation groups. They then wrote to the Australian government and said, um, we're concerned about this, would you um, uh, accept a, a monitoring mission to come? And the Australian government said yes, they could hardly say no. And two members, one from UNESCO and one from IUCN came and they wrote a very damning report which then went to the World Heritage Committee and led to the, um, yeah, basically said, um, this is early 2012, in the immediate future it is clear that the scale of coastal development currently being proposed and consented presents a significant risk to the Great Barrier Reef and that the scale and pace of development proposals appear beyond the capacity for independent quality and transparent decision making. So this is early 2012. Um, and what they were particularly concerned about were three major coal ports that were proposed. So I've shown in white there the major coal ports that exist, Gladstone, Dalrymple, Hay Point um, and Abbott Point. And then there was a proposal up in North Queensland um, in a pristine area for the Wongai project, but then down just north of Gladstone, two other coal loading facilities. So um, the World Heritage Committee then expressed its concern based on this report and resolved that it requested Australia not to permit any new development or associated infrastructure outside of the existing and long established major port areas within or adjoining the property. So it was really amazing from international bodies very rarely interfere with domestic um, decisions. But here was the World Heritage Committee saying basically don't expand your existing ports.
and they were particularly looking at the Fitzroy Terminal Project and the Balakava Island Coal Export Terminal. Um, and what happened was the Australian government and the state government said, oh my God, I'm sorry, re rephrase that so it's not any religious connotations, oh my gosh, um, there is um, a World Heritage um, concerns about this. Um, clearly we need to predict the Great Barrier Reef, no to these projects. Big red cross across them. Um, do you think that happened? No, that didn't happen. Um, basically, we could never have you know, our government saying no to one of these big projects, but fortuitously for Australia, right at this time, the coal sector tanked, the price of coal fell, and a whole heap of projects that had been proposed, including these port expansions, all went off the table. So from 2010, 2012, when the international concern was raised to when Australia came to respond, a lot of the projects that had caused concern had just gone away. They hadn't been refused by Australia, but it then meant that the Australian government response and the Queensland government response could be, well, hey, we, you know, these projects are off the table, the threat's gone away, you shouldn't add us to the list of World Heritage in danger. So the projects basically went away. Um, there have been subsequent, um, at least in theory, um, um, new, new state legislation constraining port development to existing ports. One of the big issues with Gladstone is the actual port of Gladstone goes out north. The, the port actually extends north of Curtis Island and there's a proposal for um, potentially for um, more port development on the north of Curtis Island, but all of this is actually within the existing port of Gladstone, um, at least on a mapping level. So in the resolutions were never quite clear. Clearly they were aimed at these, but there was always the hedging room. And if the coal sector came, you know, if the price of coal suddenly jumped to $140 a tonne, no doubt these projects would be back on um, really quickly. And then the real test would be whether they would be approved or not. Anyway, it was an amazing time for the role of international concern in affecting our domestic decision-making processes. Okay, uh, I mentioned before that at a Commonwealth level, a new trigger was added. Um, I'll deal with the EPBC Act in Lecture 10, but I just mentioned that in 2013, Tony Windsor, the guy who's running now against Barnaby Joyce, he was, at the time, he was one of the key independents that um, had, was keeping the Gillard government in power at a national level, and basically he said to the, force the Gillard government to give him a trigger in the national environmental laws, because he was um, concerned that the state governments weren't properly regulating calcium gas, so he wanted specifically dealt with at a national level. So he got this trigger for any gas, um, CSG or large development that it will cause a significant impact on a water resource, requires assessment at a federal level. Um, now, that's all great, but for the GLNG project and all the big projects, they'd already, you know, it's like closing the gate after all the, your whole herd of horses is bolted because all of these projects had already gone through assessment, so the GLNG project had already been approved. So, great in theory, captures new mines, but the whole sector at the moment isn't really expanding apart from Carmichael and a few other, um, the, um, there's a large mine in um, New South Wales, a few mines that are still on the books, but most of them aren't um, you know, pushing ahead at this stage. Anyway, that triggers there for new projects. Can I just mention um, why there's no offshore petroleum industry in Queensland? So mining and oil and gas exploration and extraction have been prohibited in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park since the 1970s. Um, so basically that whole area on the Queensland coast since the 1970s, the original reason for the um, um, Great Barrier Reef being declared at a national level was from a national campaign when there were proposals for mining and exploration for gas um, along in, the, in the Great Barrier Reef and that led to international, a national campaign to have it protected. At the time, in the, just in the 60s, there'd been massive oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico. So they didn't just happen with you know, the Exxon um, 
Well, the, was it Shell? Or Exxon. What was the one that happened in 2000 and... BP, yeah, the BP um, big spill. Well, there was an even bigger one in the 1960s that huge oil um, spills were occurring in the 1960s. So, um, basically, Australia decided in the 70s that there would be no oil and gas exploration or extraction in the Great Barrier Reef. So we've written off pretty well our whole of Queensland coast. You don't actually see that in one of our climate change measures, but it's probably one of the biggest things that Australia has ever done for climate change was basically say, because it's clearly there would be a lot of petroleum resources in the GBR, given its geology and, you know, it's relatively easy to extract, but we're not exploring there, we're not allowing it to be developed. And which is why also I'm focusing on the nat the onshore laws. There's a whole swag of laws that deal with offshore mining, offshore petroleum and gas e extraction, but there's no industry for it, so let's not bother with it. Okay, um, when you're looking at um, <coughs> mining petroleum laws, <coughs> remember last week we talked about the Mineral Resources Act, um, and I mentioned the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act and the Environmental Protection Act, and also there's the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. So big projects, um, it's in your interest if you go and get designated under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act because the Coordinator General is your bully in government who will go and push your project. So um, basically force the project through. Uh, and also the Coordinator General becomes the key decision maker around the environmental impact statement. So it's, it's very much like putting, um, is it Colonel Sanders who's Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yeah, Colonel, it's like putting Colonel Sanders in charge of the hen house, you know? You're going to lose a lot of chickens, um, but that's the way we've got it set up for big projects. And I gave you this as a handout last week. So in national parks, you can't explore for oil and gas, um, CSG, but that's only 5% of the state. Outside of that, development other than mining and petroleum is dealt with under the Sustainable Planning Act. And then for mining and petroleum, you separate out issues associated with tenure and royalties and environmental protection issues. Now, tenure and royalties is actually really important because of particularly tenure, the um, issues associated with like lock the gate, they wanted to stop companies going onto their land. And so that's all associated with tenure and land access. So a company like Santos that wants to explore in a large area, they need to get access to the land. Sure, you can do a lot of things, you know, outside the land, but you know, if you're going to drill and do range of seismic testing across land, you need access. So if someone's saying, no, you can't come onto my land, then you need a lawful, um, you know, you need a regime that gets you that access. So um, tenure royalties is important and Petroleum and Gas Production Safety Act is where you get those things for CSG. I said last week that the definition, the, the basic split is based on what you're after. If you're going after something for its mineral or its petroleum properties, then you're under that regime. But if you're not, then you're under the Sustainable Planning Act. So if you were um, wanted to operate a quarry, let's just say you're acting for someone who wants to go in um, and say it's the Department of Transport, they need rock for, to make bitumen. So they want to go in and mine a hillside and create a hard rock quarry. So they're going in blasting and then they're going to crush it on site and they end up with a whole heap of rock which they'll then mix with bitumen and you make you know roads out of or cement so if you're going in and getting sand um, and you're wanting to use sand in the cement then those things are dealt with under the sustainable planning act but you could be doing the, exactly the same activity and if you're after some mineral quality of the rock or the sand then you're actually under the mineral resources legislation. It really depends what you're going after. And I said last week that the definitions don't really make sense, that coal, for instance, is not technically a mineral in a geological sense, um, but it's certainly regarded as a mineral under the law. The law. Um, similarly with petroleum, it turns a lot on the definition, and there's a definition of petroleum in Section 10 of the Petroleum and Gas Act. I won't go there because it's just as long and convoluted, um, makes about as much sense as the definition of mineral. You can summarise it basically in this way. 
Um, if you're going after a solid hydrocarbon, so coal, you're under the Mineral Resources Act. If you're going after a liquid or a gaseous hydrocarbon, you're under the Petroleum and Gas Act. So obviously oil, like classic oil, it's a liquid hydrocarbon, um, and coal seam gas, what you're after is the methane. So methane and, you know, you're after hydrocarbons. Um, so if, you, if that's what you're after, liquid or gaseous hydrocarbons, Petroleum and Gas Act is what, what you should be looking at. And that's really the main, you know, the long convoluted definitions. That's what I think you can really boil, boil it down to. If you're after those, those things, you know, look at that, those different bits of legislation. Um, okay, I was going to go on to applications, but I see it's five to three. Why don't we take a five minute break, get up, stretch your legs, um, we'll come back and we'll look at different tenures, environmental authority, and go on to look at ports after the break. So welcome back to our lecture. We have been talking about the Santos GLNG project and um, the laws that regulate CSG and then the overall pipelines. Um, we are going to go on to talk now about the tenures associated with um, the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act. So as I said the, just before the break, the major laws regulating the extraction of the gas are the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act and the Environmental Protection Act. And the main tenures for coal seam gas are, is that too dark? Would you like it a bit lighter? <coughs> Sorry, I think I put them all to off rather than just low. Can you see now? Okay, so the main tenures for coal seam gas, and as I say, these are important because if you're a you know, the, there's such concern in the community about coal seam gas that farmers were blocking access. So the ability to go onto land for exploration um, is given by the authority to prospect, so the, we'll call the ATP. And then the petroleum lease is the actual extraction. So you, you, last week for mining, we learned that the exploration permit was the exploration tenure, uh, and then the mining lease was the actual production of the mineral. So here, similar terms, but yeah, ATP. Uh, and ATPs cover a large area, um, and yeah. Okay, linked to the tenures, I, I don't need to go into the details of the Petroleum and Gas Act, like if you, you know, they're, they're really simple bits of legislation really to use in comparison to you know what you're dealing with for the group assignment with the complexities of a planning scheme, that's quite challenging when to get across it. But if you end up working in the CSG sector, the actual legislation is really simple. And I'll look at um, at the end of the lecture. I'll look at a uh, example of an environmental authority. So the conditions of approval is where you might have complexity about monitoring or the like. So the environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act. Um, is the other thing that you need, and it deals with environmental issues. But again, I won't go into the legislation in detail. It's Chapter 5 of the Environmental Protection Act. Um, and I'll look at, as I say, I've, I've put up um, one of the environmental authorities for the GLNG project. I put it up on the Blackboard site. And I was going to, going to say that for further reading for this lecture, if you could go and have a look at that, just to see one. Because working in the sector now, I might just go back for a moment, working in the sector now, the major expansion, you know, the construction phase is finished, but if you end up working in the CSG sector now, what you, and say you're an environmental manager, environmental scientist, or an engineer, um, you will have, there's still a lot of work with ongoing monitoring and environmental management issues associated with them. And that then means that you're dealing with the compliance with the environmental authorities. That's the big thing you've got to do. So still a considerable amount of work there. So go and have a look at a real environmental authority and just see um, what they look like. Okay, just want to ask this question though, float this question for you. So why does the Queensland government have three EIS processes? 
So it's not quite trivial pursuit, um, but I'll just explain it. We've got, is it, remember we talked about environmental impact assessment last week, and I said, okay, you've got environmental impact assessment is the term used for any formal assessment of environmental impacts. The major, or most commonly known form of it is an in preparation of an environmental impact statement comes from US legislation from 1969, and the term's been widely adopted around the world, and people just talk about EISs. It's just one form of environmental impact assessment. In Queensland, we've got three whole procedures for EISs to be prepared. One under the Environmental Protection Act, one under the Sustainable Planning Act, and one under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. The Environmental Protection Act, one, basically deals with any mining project, or related things. Sustainable Planning Act can deal with any non-mining project. Um, in practice, it, it's never used. There's, so the IDAS system that we've talked about earlier has an information and referral system and public advertising. That's a form of environmental impact assessment. But if you look at the Sustainable Planning Act, right at the back, there's this whole process for an, an environmental impact statement to be prepared for you know, a shopping centre or whatever. It's never used. Just no one ever uses it. It sits there. I didn't deal with it in IDAS because it's never used and I don't want to waste your time. But now I just want to mention that there is a whole EIS process there. And then the State Development Public Works Organisation Act has a whole EIS process as well, which can cover any large project, mining or um, development. Now, the Environmental Protection Act process could be applied to like a shopping centre if with a small change to the law. You could still use the same process, but it's not. Um, so, and there's been a big focus for the last decade on reducing the number of laws we've gotten. We've still got, though, these three EIS processes. It just seems obvious that you could get rid of them all and just have the Environmental Protection Act, for instance, and that could cover everything. So why do you think we've still got three? So chocolate going begging here. Have a go. Any good reason? Why do you think we've got three? I'll give you a hint. The Environmental Protection Act is administered by the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection. The Sustainable Planning Act is administered by the Department of Planning. It's got a longer name than that, but Department of Planning. And the State Development uh, Act is administered by the Coordinator General, who's a statutory bureaucrat. It's a statutory office, a bureaucrat, who's appointed basically to facilitate large development in Queensland. So they're administered by three different entities. That's a big hint. Yes? Conflict of interest? Not quite. But you did, I did um, say any good attempt. So I've got a couple more chocolates left. Any more? It's not about conflict of interest as such. Yep. Is it because they don't communicate with each other? Um, not quite again. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Not quite, again, um, you know, there is, um, the Queensland Government has moved into the internet age and, yep, they can use email or a phone or have a meeting. So they do communicate, but they're separate entities. Yep? Is it just so that they can't, like, they can't flow through this? What a great answer. There's more chance of catching what's wrong, which is exactly the opposite, actually, of why we have it. <laughs> the reason we have it is actually about power and turf wars in government. So the Environmental Protection Act could cover all activities, but it's administered by the Environment Department, which isn't very green, but is seen as green in government. And government, if you ever work for it, is very hierarchical. There are the senior departments like premiers and treasury. Treasury controls the money, so they're at the top of the tree. The Department of State Development, um, depart yeah, with the coordinator general, is right at the top of the tree as well. And then you go through Department of Transport, the big departments, 
all the way down to the small departments, and typically environment is right at the bottom. So environment minister will, will tend to be a junior minister with not a lot of power in government. So the Sustainable Planning Act um, is in the planning department, um, or administered by them and local governments, um, but, and the State Development Act is the coordinator general. So we could give it all to the Department of Environment and Heritage, but um, a few years ago when, um, well basically, the coordinator general is there to basically facilitate large development. So for big projects, he, I'm gonna use he deliberately because I don't think there's ever been a female appointed to the position, it's always been a male. But he, let's say, he or she, in theory, um, we've got majority female cabinet now, you who, uh, in Queensland, and uh, um, you know they might appoint a, um, a lady to be the coordinator general. But the coordinator general is about getting these big projects through, um, and wouldn't want to give power over environmental impact assessment to the Department of Environment. Why would you possibly do a stupid thing like that? Let the Environment Department assess the environmental impacts. Whoa, scary thought. So um, the State Development Act is basically for the big projects. Um, the Environmental Protection Act really only picks up small mines that don't get a Guernsey under the Coordinator General's um, process. The, State, the Sustainable Planning Act created an EIS about 10 years ago in, in the equivalent earlier legislation because at the time the Commonwealth Government wanted to accredit state government processes for um, uh, under the Commonwealth EPBC Act and the Queensland Government put forward the information referral process under the um, then planning legislation and the Commonwealth refused and said no it doesn't meet our standards. So they created an EIS process reluctantly in the planning legislation. Again they could have just plugged in the Environmental Protection Act but that would have given power from the planning department to the environment department. So they, instead of doing that, they just created their whole, own whole process. So there's actually a lot of complexity here, completely unnecessary in some ways, but also from the coordinate general's perspective, very necessary because they control big projects, basically. So why does Queensland government have three EIS processes? It's about power and turf wars uh, in government. Okay, the Coordinator General's website, you might get the impression that I'm a huge fan of the Coordinator General, love his work. Um, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I've been written quite a number of articles critical of. My view is the whole Coordinator, okay, we could keep the Coordinator General's role. I think it's completely ridiculous that the Department of Environment doesn't administer the environmental impact statement. Much as I would criticise the Department of Environment, I think it would be far better if they were in charge of it and the Coordinator General should basically have a facilitation role. It's crazy that we put um, the Coordinator General in charge of environmental impact assessment for major projects like CSG, but we do. So if you go onto the Coordinator General's website, you can get background information on big projects like the GLNG project. It, you can go and look at um, coordinated projects. It'll give you links to the EIS and all that sort of stuff. And then the EIS process under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. Um, in um, the case of the GLNG, so it was made a coordinated project. They used to be called significant projects. That changed in 2012. Um, but basically, yeah, you've got an initial advice statement, then an EIS is prepared, goes out for public consultation. There's typically a supplementary EIS in response to the public comments, and then the Coordinated General's report. So that report at the end, <coughs> someone's got to write it, and um, you'll see that there's been significant criticisms of um, the Coordinated General's um, reports in relation to GLNG in particular. But here's some articles from 2012, 2013. So this is the front page of the Courier Mail, Dash for Cash, with um, Anna Bly, the Premier at the time, on the front cover. And then if you turned over to page six, you can see spread across the two page pages, pressure felt um, to rush CSG approvals. And then if I just focus in on the um, one on the left, this is just a picture of it closer up. 
bureaucrats leaned on by Bly heavies. So this is, I'll just read you the first few paragraphs, you get the idea. Public servants at the two departments tasked with giving the official go-ahead to Queensland's new coal seam gas industry were blindsided by Bly government demands that two of the gigantic projects be approved within weeks of each other. Documents obtained by an investigation by the Courier Mail that revealed that the 18 billion Santos GLNG project was nearing its approval in May 2010 sorry, when it was nearing its approval, public servants were hit with demands from the government to also tackle the $16 billion QGC project and then the Origin-led AP LNG proposal approved in November of the same year. And just days before the QGC approval was granted, public servants were warning the directors of the government's assessment team that they still had not been given any detailed information on pipelines and the location of wells. They also warned a long list of environmental issues had not been fully analysed. The approvals were made under etc. So hardly a ringing endorsement of the process for approving what were at the time three of the biggest pro projects ever in Queensland's history. This is um, an a extract from an email from the Director of uh, Environmental Impact Statement Assessment with the then Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, which was DERM at the time. It was called the Department of Environment and Resource Management. So Stuart Cameron, 4th of May 2010, response to a request for draft conditions to be submitted in three days, says, I have consistently been advised by the Department of Infrastructure and Planning, that's where the Coordinator General was at the time, that QGC was down the track and that DIP had not even started writing their report. We have had no warning for this sudden request for immediate provision of QGC conditions or any notice of a meeting today. In addition, we have, had, we have the APLNG comment on their EIS due today for which we have been given less than four weeks to deal with 10,000 pages. Once again, I'm faced with a physically impossible request along with the other 80 EIS projects that are starting to slip. So that's 2010, right in the peak boom when mining was going off the scale. Coal was at $140 a tonne. There were these three big, well, there was four big um, projects on the boil at the time. They all wanted their approvals immediately. Um, so that's from the time. When we come to lecture 13 um, and the um, ethics lecture. I'll play you some more of this. I might actually just play you a bit now. It's from a Four Corners report from 2013. Alive with methane. Never seen it before. Water you can set fire to. The industry says it's all perfectly safe. The last thing I want to be associated with is an industry that's going to be toxic or poison. It's just not that. But others disagree. I think the truth is that it's not an ecologically sustainable activity. Behind the scenes in the great coal seam gas debate. Welcome to Four Corners. The CSG industry is worth many billions and growing massively, particularly down the eastern half of Australia. I'm going to pause it there. Um, it's a really interesting program, um, but I just wanted to give you the flavour of it. I'm going to come back to it and particularly talk about this lady, um, Simone Marsh, who was working for the Coordinator General's office at the time and was told that um, for the um, GLNG project, the report that was being written um, wasn't to include anything on groundwater and she said, what do you mean? Groundwater is one of the big issues for the assessment of this project and, and she was taken to a room and told um, that the, the report that she was to write was not to include a section on groundwater um, and then she wrote, well actually i pause it there, um, why do you think she was taken into a room and told that? They didn't want to take it into consideration. It's not quite that. Has anyone here ever worked for government? Okay, if, if you work for government, you'll quickly work out. There's a process that's been around for 20 years called freedom of information. And basically, public can request documents from you. A document can be an email. 
It can be a you know, physical document, electronic document, it can be a paper document. Um, to avoid FOI requests, the easy way to deal with it is to pick up a phone or have a face-to-face -face meeting because there's no document record. So basically a meeting where you don't have any notes means there's no FOI record. Anyway, Simone left that meeting. She was very unhappy and she sent an, this big long email which we'll look at in the ethics lecture where basically she detailed all of her concerns. And basically when she did that, she torched her career in government because she just committed a cardinal sin in basically documenting all these concerns in a document that could then be FOI'd. So then they had to deal with it. So in terms of you know, a future landmine that will go off, that email was. So she was a really brave lady. She left um, government afterwards. And yeah, it's a really great, um, great for us to talk about when we talk about ethics. Um, but um, there were some of the concerns about the GLNG project at the time. And it's really quite shocking for these huge projects that they were all rushed. And basically now they're in place and we're into the stage of suck it and see. You know, we're going to see over the next 10, 20 years whether there are really big impacts on groundwater or whether it's not as bad as, you know, people thought originally or, you know, the concerns that were raised. Anyway, we will see part of your careers might be dealing with this as a regulator. Okay, the Regional Planning Interest Act I mentioned last week as well. Um, it was created in 2014, again, partially in response to the community concerns. Um, so the decisions about mining and CSG, there was no planning regime as such. There were these broad criteria that could be taken into account. But particularly the farming sector felt that they were not being properly protected. So they were lobbying really strongly for better protection of good quality agricultural land. And the state government's response, um, one, of, one of the big parts that it did was to create the Regional Planning Interest Act 2014, which principally protects priority agricultural areas, strategic cropping areas, priority living areas, strategic environmental areas is there as a bit of an add-on. It's really about protecting cropping. Um, so and agricultural areas. So there's, um, it requires resource activities to have, uh, or applies to resource activities. Um, but for our project, GLNG didn't exist in 2009, 2010. So GLNG wasn't assessed under it. And all of the big projects that have been, were approved in 2010, you know, this act is sitting there, but at least at this stage, there's no more projects, um, big project coming through. So the ones that were already approved, weren't assessed under this. Now the pipeline, don't need to go into in detail, under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, it gives basically the State Development or the Coordinator General basically power to declare pipeline corridors and effectively allow compulsory acquisition of land for pipelines to cross across. Um, and yeah, I don't need to go into the approval requirements for the pipeline as such. I really want to spend a bit of time on the LNG hub in Gladstone. And I want to unpack development in ports because, and this is um, also significant for planners, so um, the major ports have their own special planning schemes um, and major development areas um, can be designated as state development areas by, again, by the Coordinator General under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. So it's a very powerful bureaucrat. and. Um, for instance, in Gladstone, there's a state development area that's been um, declared. So you can see here it's um, coloured in. So under the um, Gladstone state development area, see the purple out on, on um, Curtis Island? So out um, here, that's the Curtis um, Island uh, industry precinct. So that's where all the gas was going. And then the green was an environmental management precinct. And then you've got other precincts within it. So it looks very similar to, you know, like a strategic plan or a, um, a zoning plan under a local government planning scheme. But it's at this, um, basically at a state level. Um, and clearly, if you're proposing development within that, that will be an important critical part of the um, planning framework. Um, I should say too that actually maybe the next slide is the slide is the best way to deal with it. So port authorities um, are also created under the Transport Infrastructure Act, 
um, and they control development on strategic port land under a land use plan prepared under that Act and integrated into the IDAS system. So we've got a state development area in places like Gladstone or Brisbane, um, Port um, or Townsville, and then you've got a port authority. So basically it's a um, statutory authority that's established under the Transport Infrastructure Act and they operate like a, a local government um, for the development within the port area. So they, for instance, just focusing on Gladstone for our case study, um, there's special planning for major ports under the Trans Transport Infrastructure Act in Gladstone. The ports corporate, there's a Gladstone Ports Corporation and it's created a land use plan in 2012. And if you look at the land use plan, you know, here's the hierarchy that's in it. Transport Infrastructure Act creates a land use plan, is integrated into the Sustainable Planning Act and we use IDAS. So what we've already covered in relation to IDAS would be applicable if you were developing in the port, including the gas hub. So, um, and it's all linked into the regulations. Remember when we talked about accessible development, um, that you can look um, in, you need to look and be aware of what's in the regulations as well as what's in things like the relevant planning scheme. So in Schedule 3 of the sustainable planning regulations, one of the triggers for accessible development is making a material change of use of premises on strategic port land that is inconsistent with the land use plan approved under the Transport Infrastructure Act, and that's code accessible. Um, and similarly, um, all aspects of development on strategic port land other than development mentioned above, that's the material change of use one, is accessible development and code assessment. So there's your trigger. And then the um, documents that are applied in the assessment for strategic port land um, development that has to be assessed under one of those triggers, you assess it against the current land use plan approved under the Transport Infrastructure Act. So it's basically very much like a local government planning scheme, but applying to the port. And the assessment manager um, normally is the local government, but for strategic port land, the assessment manager um, is typically the, the port authority. So they're, they're very similar to a little local government just for their port. And the major ports, so here's the Gladstone City Council planning scheme, strategic plan, and you can't see it, but blue is strategic port land. So this is the local government, and basically you'd find under the planning scheme, it pretty well defers to the port authority's planning scheme. And um, the Minister for Transport can also be one of the referral agencies for development in those areas. So um, I just should um, clarify. So the major ports that we've got along the Queensland coast where you've got port authorities, what do you reckon they are? So start in the southern end, we've got Brisbane, Port of Brisbane as a port authority. What do you reckon the next one is? Gladstone is a big one. Um, and then there's also basically a ports authority for the bulk um, loading facilities at Mackay, Hay Point and Bowen, um, Abbott Point, which is the um, North Queensland bulk ports um, authority. So there's a port authority for them. And then there's Townsville. I think they're the four. Can't think of any others off the top of my head. But so basically these are like four local governments for those major ports. Okay. So um, that's strategic port land, just to be aware of. And so for planners, um, you know, if you're working, say, in Brisbane, you need to be aware of, you know, who are the players in the, in the zoo. And um, if you're involved in development out at the port, um, it's the port authority is like the local government for that area. Okay. Um, final stage, are these applications likely to be granted? Um, uh, how... In terms of how they're assessed, it's very similar to um, what we talked about last week with mining, that there's broad um, qualitative um, things to be weighed up, um, for, particularly for the CSG components under the Environmental Protection Act and the Petroleum and Gas Act. And as I said last week for mining, typically the um, economics of the extraction of the resource and jobs trumps environmental issues. So they're broad qualitative criteria. Under the um, 
for the approval of the LNG refineries in Gladstone, you can see that there's this strategic port land, there's the state development area that's been declared over the area, and you saw under the state development um, legislation that there was a precinct set up for the Curtis Island Industrial Hub. So you can pretty well assume that the development of the um, infrastructure in Curtis Island is consistent with those levels of planning. So because it's consistent, it's likely to be approved. So that just links back into what we've learned before. Cool. Okay, um, in terms of conditions of approval, I want to just um, give you an example of a real environmental authority. So as I said, a lot of the work in, um, at present in CSG is really about dealing with the um, conditions of approval for existing, um, existing um, activities. So this is um, a real environmental authority, 78 pages long, and let's just have a look at some parts of it. So you can see it's under the Environmental Protection Act, Level 1 Environmental Authority, Chapter 5A, Petroleum Activity, which now would be just Chapter 5 um, Environmental Authority. It's just referring to the old structure of the Act. Gives you a permit number, um, and then the holder of the authority is Santos C CSG Proprietary Limited, so a subsidiary of the Santos Group. Um, and, whoops. And the project there, the project name is the Roma Shallow Gas Project Area. Then the resource authority types and numbers, so you've got the authority to prospects, ATP 336, and then petroleum leases that it's linked to. And when it takes effect, it's signed off by a delegate of um, the administering authority, Kate Wall. Um, so working for the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection. This one's from 2013. And it then goes on to list additional advice about the approval, um, the ERAs that it covers. So ERA 9, hydrocarbon gas refining, ERA 10, gas producing, ERA 14, electricity generation, ERA 15, fuel burning, ERA 60, waste disposal, and ERA 63, sewage treatment and also ERA 8, chemical storage. So a whole range of ERAs, and it goes on to a few other general things, but I just wanted to show you the structure of it. So in, the environmental authorities in Queensland typically are um, set out in schedules like this, so you've got your general conditions, underground gas storage, water, dams, land, environmental nuisance, air. So what do you reckon, what should we have a look at? Let's just have a look at one. If you're, Sorry, which one? Water. Water, okay, so water, um, Schedule C, Let's see if we can find it easily. Oh, sorry, can I just go back for a second? Financial assurance is in the news quite a lot at the moment because you might have seen that um, um, Peabody Energy that we talked about um, to start with the big coal mining company that just went into bankruptcy, um, as well as Clive Palmer with the um, nickel refinery. Um, and basically there's a, a big problem that we've had in the past is companies go in and mine an area and then when the resource is extracted, um, the company just folds. So they've got all their profits out, they just fold and you're left with a big unrehabilitated hole in the ground. Um, so to deal with that, because we've got thousands of old mine sites that haven't been re rehabilitated in Queensland, it's a massive problem. What the system we've created over the last 20 years is a system of financial assurances, where as part of your environmental authority, it's the, in, the regulator assesses what is the likely cost of rehabilitating your project. And they require that to be paid in to a bank and basically given a bank guarantee so the money is set aside. And it can be hundreds of millions of dollars, like um, Mount Isa, I think the financial assurance was in the range of about $400 million for you know a large gold mine or something like that. You might have 20 or $30 million sitting there. The nickel refinery no doubt would have tens of millions of dollars because you've got all of the, like if the company walks away, you've got to deal with the waste. You've still got to deal with the site. So. Um, the financial assurance is critical for ensuring that the government has got money 
set aside to pay for that if the company walks away. The financial assurance can be surrendered at the end of a project if the rehabilitation is done properly, and it cha can change over time depending on the stage of the project and how much is the estimated cost of the likely rehabilitation. So it can, yeah, it can change over time. Companies don't like it because um, you require them to put in, say, $100 million, and it sits in a bank guarantee, and they might get, say, 6% return on that or 4%. Most resource companies want, say, 20% return on their capital, so it's, it costs them. Um, so they don't like it, but it's a really important component of all of our environmental authorities in Queensland. Um, different states have different approaches to financial assurances. Either you pay, all mines pay in a little bit, and it builds up in a big pot of money, but then the problem is you give a perverse incentive for them to walk away. If they've paid in, say, $5 million that they won't see back, but it's like $60 million to rehabilitate their site, why don't they just say, oh, okay, we'll go into bankruptcy, um, fold up our subsidiary company, and then just walk away, and then the $60 million gets drawn out of the kitty. So this approach, in, the approach in Queensland is to require them to put in the whole amount that is the likely rehabilitation costs, and then that can be drawn, and it's to, to really stop the perverse incentive to just walk away because they know that if there's $50 million sitting there and if they think they can do the rehabilitation for, say, $40 million, then there's $10 million that they can get back. So they do the rehabilitation um, and get some money back, potentially. So financial assurance is a really significant issue and really important right now because of all these companies teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. But we were looking at... Um, water. So, um, so Schedule B, underground gas, storage, and C, sh um, water. So C1, contaminant release. Contaminants must not be directly or indirectly released to any waters except as permitted under this environmental authority. And then basically there's an erosion and sediment control plan that's got to be prepared. Um, so it's quite common for these documents to set out requirements for plans that then have to be implemented, and you get a detailed sediment control plan or something like that. And you can see the sorts of things there. Erosion and sediment control plan must include, but, but not necessarily be limited to, managing or diverting uncontaminated stormwater runoff around areas disturbed by petroleum activities, or where contaminants or waste are stored or handled that may contribute to contamination of waters, ensuring that contaminated water, etc. So um, maintenance and cleaning of vehicles, C6. Um, works in water courses, C7. Unless otherwise authorised under this environmental authority, petroleum activities that require earthworks, vegetation clearing, placing and or placing fill and or that will result in significant disturbance other than that associated with the construction and maintenance of linear infrastructure is not permitted within in or within 200 metres of any wetland, lake or spring, 100 metres of the high banks of any other watercourse. So a lot of detail here. Given that you've got, if you're the project holder, you've got hundreds of wells, you've got roads all over the place, you've got infrastructure, actually complying with these conditions in practice becomes a really big issue. Um, get the idea? Turbidity goes on for pages, floodplains, um, where carried out on a floodplain area, the holder of this environmental authority must ensure that the petroleum activities does not concentrate flood flows in a way that will or may cause or threaten any adverse environmental impact, divert flood flows, etc. And then groundwater. Um, well drilling completion and stimulation. Pages on that. So. Get the idea. A lot of detail there in the conditions. So if you guys end up working in this sector, it's that sort of document becomes the backbone of, you know, you, if you're an environmental manager or an environmental scientist and you're going out to implement sediment controls, you'll have a sediment control plan. It's linked to the conditions of approval. And if you don't, you know, if a company doesn't comply with it, then they can be prosecuted for it. Cool. Okay. So that's the. Um, Environmental Authority. I'll put the, I've already actually put the Environmental Authority up on the Blackboard site. You can have a look at it um, and just flick through it. 
Okay, let's wrap up. In today's lecture, um, we looked at the um, Santos GLNG project in the context of the overall CSG LNG industry in Queensland, and then looked at what laws regulate it, and we've particularly focused on um, the Petroleum and Gas um, Act and the Environmental Protection Act, and talked also about the State Development Act and its role in environmental impact assessment and the concerns about the approval of these big projects that were expressed at the time, very significant. Um, the approval process has really let us down. They were really poor practices in many ways, and yet these were massive projects that the consequences of, the consequences of these projects that were approved in 2010 in a rush will be felt for generations, you know, so your working lives, um, we will see exactly what the impacts of these industries are, but it will take decades possibly for them really to come to light. Okay, in terms of further reading, um, you can have a look at the Santos GLNG project um, website, there's the Coordinator General's website, um, and have a look at the Environmental Authority on the Blackboard site. So take home points, final slide. Um, Mining and petroleum, it's exempt development under SPA, therefore IDAS doesn't apply to them. And the key thing is to work out what you're going after. If, you're, um, if it's a mineral or it's a petroleum, then you're under that regime. The definitions of mineral and petroleum are the keys to understanding what activities are exempt from SPA. Um, and then within the petroleum regime, there's different regimes at a state level for tenure and royalties versus environmental protection and mining versus petroleum, and gas is including, included in petroleum. Onshore and offshore activities, and I've ignored offshore activities, because it's just basically there's nothing in that industry in Queensland, but there's a lot of laws there. And also state development areas and ports have special planning regimes, just be aware of that. In terms of port authorities, they're a significant player if you're you know, working in Brisbane, Gladstone, Townsville, um, particularly. The Port Authorities are a big, big part of the planning regime. Hey, thanks guys. Um, that's the lecture for today. I will see you next week. <laughs>